speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Side affirmative is happy to trade off the free rider's right to self-actualize or, or to tell the society what they think at the expense of the vulnerable, because we think the protection of the vulnerable in the society itself is important, but moreover, we think the self-protection of the ideal and the security of companies within their own premise is equally important for these profit-making companies. With that being said, as a stance from side affirmative, I'm going to um, first clarify the model. Uh, which is quite simple. So we're going to allow or assume that social media networks like Facebook or Twitter are going to delete offensive or controversial uh, uh, statements on their uh, on their websites. And this offensive, uh, the uh, the definition of offensiveness or controversial things could be decided based on their internal criteria, which probably would be decided based on their their own stance and also common sense. So with that being said, uh, I have two substantive matters from the Prime Minister. Number one, what are the practical harms of completely rampant free speech and the benefit of regulating those? Secondly, I'm going to talk about why do private media corporations have independent rights to censor certain activities on their premises, uh, which would justify this motion. So number one, what is happening on the rest of the US by completely allowing all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, opinions on that? Oftentimes, these controversial or offensive speeches cause massive harm, psychological and sometimes physical harms to minorities or the vulnerable peoples. For example, bullying kids in school. If everyone, we have to imagine how harsh it is when everybody in class make fun of how you look like or your skin color. Or for like racial minorities, religious minority to be pointed by white supremacists uh, like shit pole people or neo-Nazi people posting images of burning a Muslim child on the web. This is simply terrifying and it extremely hurts the feeling because you, you feel like no one in the world, like at least the vast majority or some radical people think that you're not a human even. You're like an animal and you should die or just leave the country. Also, this is, excludes minorities or the vulnerable or the attack people from speaking up because they're simply threatening these people and it also silences the vast majority, the silent majority people because if they try to side up with these people, probably these radicalists might, may say that the next one, the next target would be you. This is why a clear, clear mechanism of the status quo of how this kind of Posts are hurting people and also the, the majority people not being able to stand by the side of the, of the attack. If we take this proposal, this, the mechanism is quite simple and clear cut. If Facebook is able to intervene into these kind of, um, of offensive posts, like by deleting them or saying that this should be condemned based on Facebook policy, this will clearly deter, if, if not be, make it like completely impossible that of, of these people from being attacked. So that's why we see a clear practical benefit on the status for which probably they may, they would not uh, oppose. So, Ms. ladies and gentlemen, why is it important, not yet, why is it important for private media corporations to have such kind of right to protect the, the, their customers? Number one, there is right not to be hijacked by outsiders by, for all corporations. So we have to note that Facebook is a private entity which is making profit and which is hiring their employees. So they obviously have the right to protect their own business. And defending security within their premise is very important. It's like, like, it's like a private property like real estate and not allowing certain activities on that premise because if like there is a nudist person on your, like in your uh, movie theater, this may not allow other people to go in there. And that's why we think that they do uniquely have a right to, to state that what's preferable, what's not preferable, what's not allowed. And this also happened, probably their question may be, like there are certain like harmful things which are not already allowed in public. We were still fine for like private corporations to intervene in those. For example, even when there, these situations are completely like completely like legal ones, uh, we allow companies. For example, we ban real money trade on online games, or we we, we allow like Facebook or other SNS sites from banning the IK, which may lead to illegal but and very risky activities, which might jeopardize their business even on top of the legal framework. That's why it's important to. First off, secondly, we also think that there's right 
uh, allowed right for some preferred customer at the expense of somebody else. For example, gakuari or women's discount is potentially inconvenient for mainstream men because they they have less accessibility to these sites. Also, like halal places, like intend to serve Muslims and maybe like the store is full by Muslims, which may exclude like average Japanese people going into that place. But these are uh, these entities are all allowed to have their all the original ideal and the worldview in order to serve their preferred customers in order to uh, defend their own business. Yes. This is not about policy debate. It's about some some actions of corporations. Please explain why this action is very good for society or a corporation in general. Okay. So we have told you that it is important for corporations to protect themselves because if rampant action happens, even if it's like kind of technically legal, happen on their site, this may be extremely unpreferable for them to make profit and to survive as a legal person. Why can't this even happen for media companies? Like, they have the right. So the example here I'm, I'm going to deliver you is like example of Fox News and CNN. They select the information to be broadcast even if, it, if it's not completely fair. They deliberate what kind of narrative to give to those information to progress their own ideals. Why is this an okay right for them to pursue? So a better society, like their preferable customers, is, a necess is necessary for survival because reforming the society to their preferable way would increase customers on their side and they have no, no responsibility to actually serve people who don't really go or don't really agree with their activities. And there is no difference between a legal person pursuing its own ideal in the world to make it a more comfortable place because their survival is equally important because it is connecting to the survival of their employees and so forth. So we don't see there is a huge difference between a legal person and a natural person. What we have to emphasize, again, in the last of PM speech is that number one, like, like leaving this alone simply hurts the vulnerable. It excludes vulnerable people from the society. We think that it's also legitimate for these companies to independently make the decision on what's good for them, for their own survival. And for those reasons, Ms. ladies and gentlemen, the motion should stand. Thank you. First, we'll do a clarification of our case. Firstly, that we are going to support the user to voluntarily like choosing which content they're going to access by using the method of going and blocking certain account or like using the mute or etc. Right? Because this is not about the uh, like social media corporation actively deciding the which content or actively intervening to yeah, yeah. content, right? And we think this is just like like uh, mere users are choosing the which content they are going to access. We think it's out of the way. But secondly, uh, also that like, we are okay with the like also social media corporation reactively tackle the certain like speech problem in accordance with the court order, right? Because this is basically like state uh, decided by state a standard by the order of the court, right? And we think that this is like totally different from the corporation actively intervening and deciding the policy, right? Yeah, yeah. So what can decide also like so yeah, what we oppose on the, in this debate is that the social media corporation are going to actively like the create for example content policy and the remove and the freeze account all sorts of stuff uh, so, uh, based on this article about two issues, firstly, I talk about the role of the social media corporation and the, why they have a moral duty to maximize the ability of the individual to express and extend their opinion and ideology, and why uh, like this rise of uh, this like, trend is going to undermine them. Secondly, I will talk about how their paradigm is damaging for a protection of the vulnerable which they concern. But before that, uh, two independent response. They said that uh, you know the protection of the vulnerable individual is more important than this protection, right? But the Given that these two are like sometimes trade and sometimes controversial, we don't think that this is a duty of the social media corporation to decide which content should be allowed or which should be prioritized in each case, right? We think it should be the role of the state which are accountable that is going to be elaborated later. Secondly, they say that you know the social media platform uh, have independent right to like censor like their own content because this is a mere private like co corporation, mere private entity, right? But we think it's too generic, right? We accept that the social media corporation are like private entity, but we think that given that they have a certain like public huge public like, dimension, they have a huge influence on society. We think that they have the moral duty to cater to their like, individual ability to, like, to express their own ideas and opinions. So on to first issue about the role of the social media corporation. Uh, okay. So now we have to recognize that in the first place, that social like SNS like corporation, that social media corporation 
start because as the platform, they have the, the, the expression, they have the like, discourse around the society, right? They have the like the rules user, right? And uh, And also we believe that given that the social media platform has a huge influence and unique uh, like platforms that can uh, like uniquely available for the majority of people, basically important, right? Regardless of your money or regardless of your physical identity, regardless of your like the place you live, that they can like spread their opinion, like they can extend the opinion from the, uh, with the people all over the world, and we think it uniquely enables the you know, literal discourse, and we think it's extremely important. But we think that you know the, uh, it's quite problematic for the social media platform. It's going to actively intervene in the situation uh, in, about the offensive or the controversial question. Because the, we are talking about the moral question, it is extremely like, controversial. Like, maybe it includes abortion rights or the like, public nudity, or like maybe like uh, the dichotomy of the like, religious right or the LGBTQ right, or those sort of stuff, right? Maybe it sometimes includes offensive content, but maybe it's also important for a certain group of people, right? It's quite controversial, there's no right answer to this, right? And reason in that kind of circumstances is that you know, it's wrong for the social media corporation, for a mere private corporation, they don't have any accountability for the general public to be actively intervening and actively making those so, uh, intervening the situation, right? They, uh, they're just like, they're not accountable for the people in the ground, right? But further, we believe that oftentimes that those sort of like, uh, social media platforms are going to be arbitrarily a little bit this censor and remove those sort of content because like, they, like those sort of people, employees in the like, social media corporation are likely to have kind of like similar like ideological like preference and they're going to remove it based on their own like criteria of the right, uh, right or wrongness. Right. For example, the Facebook actually removed the like picture of the man, a half naked man, like holding a baby. This was this is something like offensive, and this is something like um, related to the child porn, etc. But you know, some people regard this picture as a beautiful one that can represent that is like kind of symbol that like working father or etc. Right? So we think this is quite controversial, but that actually damaged by it also break. Uh, social media corporations. The reason it's still problematic, right? But the problem we think that even though this is not actually going to remove or actively intervene, this creates a like chilling effect, right? For example, maybe immigrant like issue related to immigration policy or issue re like related to uh, like ideological preference to get that cater to like only domestic citizens can sound like racist. Therefore I should refrain from talking about it because that can be like removed or that can be intervened by the social media platform also like Chilling threat is going to happen, right? We think this is going to massively undermine the ability of the individual yeah. to express and exchange opinion within that uh, uh, Okay, so for example, why isn't the government protecting these rights not enough? For example, there are national TVs which can cater to all kinds of diverse opinions. Why do you have to intervene into public cor private corporations into doing everything? Uh, because, like I already told you, that the social media corporation is a unique like, platform that can, each individual are able to access, and each individual are yeah, going yeah. to can like, uh, express their own like, ideological preference. That is like, almost impossible for the conventional media to uh, cater to the majority like, pro, uh, like, pro, like majority interest. Like, I don't think it's important. <laughs> so, secondly, on the impact. So, we think that it, this is counterproductive for a protection of the minority and vulnerable in the society for a two ways. Firstly, like when it comes to the like these very like hateful like radical and racist group, we think these kind of people are more likely to exist if social media platform is going to actively intervene, right? Because under their paradigm, that the only like method they can rely on is, for example, a publicly demonstrating or publicly like showing the hate speech in order to like show the opinion, right? It's also like hate are going to be much more visible. But furthermore, you know, this is going to allow those sort of right wing group to get the sympathy and support from the side because the fact that social media platforms are going to remove and intervene the content, create an image that they are also oppressed, or they are also victim of too much political correctness, so it says, right? Those sort of images, those sort of very passive trends are going to happen. We think this is counterproductive for the protection of minority. But further, we think that, you know, sometimes minority rights is also a controversial, right? Maybe, for example, the people who prefer the abortion or the gay right is sometimes, like, in some way, like, controversial and can potentially be, like, suppressed by the social media platform, right? And, they, and this, like, even though they are not actually going to do so, they feel that they might be, right? So this, so even, like, for minority people, it's psychologically like, even more difficult to express those of, like, uh, preference to express the opinion from the minority. So we think that, you know, uh, this is actually counterproductive for the protection of our uh, related goods.
This is eager. I'm going to extend the effeminate case by first of all explaining the unique harm that occurs uh, in terms of controversial and offensive content, which uniquely occurs in the social media. And second of all, I'm going to extend the argumentation of the role of the social media as a private corporation. Before that, three independent rebuttals. So number one, they said that it is enough to have like some sort of preemptive uh, measures so that like the users can preemptively block their contents and in order to prevent like being victimized from potentially offensive content. Now one, we think that's a contra contra contradiction with their stance. If they want to facilitate discourse, like how are they going to ach achieve the facilitation of discourse if people can like preemptively block potentially controversial contents from them? But second of all, what we say is that it's oftentimes too late. You can't preemptively block every single like content that could potentially harm you. So we think that, is, that kind of regulation is not enough. We think that social media should take an active stance on this position. Second reputation. They said that social network services are basically a platform for uh, dis have facilitating discourse for potentially controversial content. Now, I'm going like, to deal with this uh, point later on in my extension later on. but. Two independent rebuttals. One, like you don't necessarily need offensive expressions or offensive content to facilitate an activated discourse. We can have a much more rational, moderate, grounded down discourse, and we think that oftentimes those are the ones which is more productive. But secondly, like if you user thinks sit down that certain offensive content is useful, and if the vast majority of users in, for example, Facebook believe that the example that he gave was a useful content to facilitate certain discourse, there would obviously be certain discourse amongst the user to like pressure and demand the Facebook to like change their criteria or standard of regulation, and that we think that the internal discourse uh, is good because these kind of corporations constantly update and change the criteria or standard of regulation. We think that's good. The third independent rebuttal goes to them saying that social media media is a unique platform that everyone can participate and that that's the difference be between the social media and conventional media. But we say that in reality there's many different kinds of like social media platform and oftentimes they cater to a specific group of people. So like certain group of people like prefer Facebook and certain group of people prefer using Instagram. So as a consequence of that, like these social media do not have a responsibility to cater to every single one in our society. They have a responsibility to cater to protect the users that the use that the content provide. Now, moving to my first argumentation, the harm of controversial offensive content that uniquely occurs in social media. I have three points of analysis here. One, expressions on these kind of internet tends to easily heat up and becomes very vile and hostile. The reason why that is the case is that you don't actually see uh, and interact with the actual person you are offending physically. It becomes like only a digital image for you. So this dehumanization effect of the other participant, like this discourse allows more and more vile content and hostile content. That's why you see like 4chan internet troll making Photoshop image of a Muslim child being burned and posted on certain, certain social media and severely offending those kind of group of people. But second of all, we think that these offensive content and expression like, um, may, uh, is oftentimes made and targeted on an individual level. So that's the difference between conventional media. Yes, it is true that conventional media can sometimes offend like a group of people, but on a social network, people can specifically target each and every individual and personally attack them individually. As a consequence of that, we think that the victim of those uh, offensive contents feel more, feel more isolated, and those kind of hostile environments are much more easily to become invisibilized. But the third unique harm of these kind of content is that discourse on contra controversial issue is very un unlikely to occur. The reason why that is the case is because these kind of potentially controversial and meaningful discourse tends to become like heated up and more focused on emotional things rather than more rational uh, ideas because people have like selection bias and but more open. But the second reason why this uh, discourse won't happen is in social media is because people obviously have selection bias and tend to follow content and prefer contents that they already internally like prioritize. Uh, that's especially the case if the SNS is filled with violent and vile content. For example, it's very difficult, not yet, like an African-American girl who would like actively follow the, um, uh, the, uh, the page of like a Ku Klux Klan that could potentially change and controvers uh, controversially change her worldview because she feared that those kind of violent, threatful content would potentially harm her. So we don't think that any like meaningful discourse would occur in these kind of particular contexts. Yes. When you have some posts are deleting some platforms, but not deleting some other platforms, how can you protect the vulnerable that you have content in? Like by like deleting potentially offensive uh, content for that person, like we can obviously protect that those kind of people being victimized. So moving to my third argumentation, which is the role of social media as a private company. 
Now, we think that social media companies are ultimately private corporations as well. And they have a right to proliferate values and ideology that fit their own co like corporate mission and corporate image. For example, Heinz, which is an American like rental car company, and certain airline company recently stopped giving like preferential benefit, uh, benefits to NRA membership because they wanted to express certain political ideas against gun control. Another example is that like conventional media oftentimes select and prioritize certain content which fits their corporate narrative and certain ideologies that they want to proliferate. Just, just because social media provide a platform does not necessarily mean that they have a responsibility to be absolutely neutral. And we, we think that these kind of media corporations, since they are a private corporation, have a right to actively take an active stance in certain subjects and certain issues, ladies and gentlemen. So why is like active participation of corporation particularly important in today's context? There's two reasons why. First of all, obviously, and the, the more general reason is companies have like a huge influence and they actively impact and their their activity like impact our lives a lot. But second of all, this is the uniqueness of social media is that like the distance between like the business sphere and the social sphere is very close when it comes to the um, business activity of social media. Oftentimes, this sphere is overlap. That's the difference between like other potential like industries such as car industry where their business sphere and like certain social sphere is like completely separated since social for the social media the service that they provide since this sphere is overlapping very close we think as a consequence of that those social media have a right and a responsibility to actively participate in certain discourse so why is this rising intervention also good we think that conventional media as my partner mentioned also are binded, binded by things such as FCC regulation internal speech codes and they also pick and select certain contexts which prefer their own corporate narrative we think that social media's influence is, is like obviously rising in today's context, and they are becoming a very important social infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. infrastructure. Therefore, it is quite natural that they should also have a high standard on internal regulation, just as like certain like media, large conventional media corporation have an internal standard on internal regulation. So we think that the social media like uh, have meant that reach in the point of history, and that is why this important motion was stand. So next, I'd like to call on the whole to contact this piece within seven minutes. Here we go. It's not a contradiction when we say that we want discourse to be okay with filtering. It's that freedom of speech of the people, the discourse and the emotion of people are a hard thing to balance. That some people might be offended by simply challenging their views. That it might be we want to challenge Me Too movement going too far. And that's controversial, but some people might see it as sexist or misogynistic belief. And that balance is very difficult. And that's why there's so much regulation that it's a judicial thing that we are be a democracy on how to regulate free speech and the balance of that with discourse and other feelings. And that's why it's so important that the entitlement, who decides what is okay and what is not, be the democratic judgment, the judiciary. Their policy is about allowing Facebook, random people in private corporations with probably liberal preferences, but are very risk averse and just don't want their platforms to burn to be dictating on what is allowed and okay. If we're effectively in a democratic society and modern technology, this platform of social media has become the de facto standard of expressing your views and interacting with others and knowing who you prefer with. In that infrastructure of free speech, they say that random private actors should dictate what is okay and what is not. That's an infringement of democracy, that is an infringement on agreement and law and judiciary, and we proudly oppose this policy. I'll talk about two things. Firstly, what's the active intervention by social media corporations is problematic, leading we recognize the complexity of the balance of freedom of expression and emotions. Second, I'll talk about why this active intervention leads to rather counter -black backlash and harms the minorities that they want to protect, even if it's so important. Before that, rebuttal. So, most of the idea is that, you know, it's easily heated and it might be dehumanizing. Or you might see your KKK content as what well leads to bad things. It's not really a problem, because we all told you, you just block it. You just filter your like, user to optimize setting like in Facebook, or simply you don't visit those pages. If it becomes too heated and you can't tolerate it, you just <coughs> mute the person. You we think that you can do it reactively, there's no clear harm. And the best case scenario is that, you know, it might be that you can't prevent the first contact of being harmed. We think that 
there's no reason to restrict it because any like on your street or your daily conversation might be at first contact harmful. And that but reason right. that the phone wants first contact being harmful is not a reason to preemptively restrict any form of free speech. That is an unavoidable thing for human action and the nature of society to happen. Or we think that the first contact we know it exists, right. but it's mitigatable, or at least not a reason for society to restrict on free speech and opinion. Because if you restrict first hand contact, it means that we can't say anything or people fear saying anything at all because they might be punished and that's far far worse and that was democratic agreement of status quo. Cool. Let's go to substantive. So, government, uh, sure. A clarification, so you guys are okay with judicial or government regulation on speech but you're not okay with like private internal regulation, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because often we're okay with like the current environment, for example, pornographic content to be restricted, or okay with hate speech to be restricted, or for, for some judicial controversial agreement to be made to be restricted, and you know Facebook should follow that. The thing is that often they make their own ethics content, sort of liberal minority protection content, which goes further than that, up to their preferences, and makes it sort of AI algorithm to restrict things on, on tweets. That is the status quo. But if you randomly say I wanted to kill, so, uh, so just a word of kill included in a tweet, you are deleted, or you say controversial things that people like report you so much, you are deleted, your accounts are frozen, or things like that happen in the status quo. Those sort of arbitrary things that are over the judicial agreement is what you have to defend and what's the controversy of the debate. No thanks. So the only is that you know social network services are a corporation. They are one entity that has to pursue their own interests, why not let them do so? Um, true, but you have a responsibility as a platform of social discourse. Private infrastructure corporations have their own interests and their own, as an own entity, but they have huge influence on society, and what, that's why they re-regulate how they go on. Obviously, any corporation has to comply with environmental regulation because of the impact of society. Similarly, we think that these social network co corporations are the, are the de facto platform of social media. Your, your daily conversation will not reach so much. You having these sort of signboards will not reach so much. But reach so much or shared articles so you may be able to rally is effectively in the status quo Facebook groups, posting on your friends friend, or tweets that spread with retweets and showing all those things. That is because, and also because everyone is using it, that is the strongest platform, and because everyone is using it, it's a de facto platform for showing that you are able to have equal levels of access to other expression as other people. That's why they have a unique responsibility like an infrastructure. In that context, we think that when you restrict your offensive content, you know, it becomes problematic. Because the offensive existing that they want to talk about are already avoidable by blocks or user optimization, or you're simply being restricted by hate speech regulations or defamation regulation, things like that. You can go to the court, deal with it, they might be punished, you already dealt with it. So the but the thing is that there are other things that might be regulated. Like we told in the introduction, like Me Too movement counter, it's going too far. But what about it? Or Black Lives Matter going too far, you criticize. It. But it will seem be as offensive. Or some minorities believe that the existence of privileged groups or identity might be offensive. You can't restrict that. Probably you shouldn't restrict that. But it's very, very difficult to draw the line. And that's why, once again, it's the judiciary, the law, the democratic agreement that should decide. And that's why it's so important that free speech and that balance be assessed by social agreements. No, thank you. For a random private actor to do that is simply arbitrary, simply intolerable against our democracy. And it's especially problematic because that's my partner told you, and it's just a random private actor with their own preferences. They do not have authorization or consent or to be selected by the public. They also are very profit seeking or risk averse. That's why they are too prohibited and release the chilling effects that my partner talked about. And that's why, you know, it's simply principally incorrect and that the evening we, we can see that, you know, some people might be harmed. That's not a reason to allow these random actors to do it. So that's lastly on consequences. So <coughs> We know why they want to protect minorities. It's rather harmful because you know, in the status quo, these people are loosely connected on Facebook and they go on with their chit chat and things like that. They do bad things. But when they're kicked out of Facebook because of this like, aggressive policy, what happens is that they are rather angered. They rather have dismayed the social media and have uh, go rather under underground. It's underground platform. They have less exposure to countervailing view. They have this radical sentiment. That's why they gather instead of Facebook. They have, they have this unique amplifying context under underground. That's why they 
they go on to rather street violence, they rather go to hate graffiti and things like that on actual action because it ostracized them. That's more likely to happen. That's rather more harmful vividly, physically to minorities. But furthermore, because you cannot challenge controversial views by liberals or Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter movement or other things, your ability to counter and have a proper movement is lost. These movements will probably become probably more violent and then unnecessarily attack on right-wing people or controversial people. It might be simply that you're not able to get the nuance or the proper balance. That's when you lose simply the ability of democracy to have proper discussion, lose the ability to have less violence and interaction in a physical and intolerable way, and where the balance should be done by the court, not random act, private actors. very likely to occur on the dear side of chaos. What kind of harm did they bring to the table? Maybe like people can be selective when they encounter speech. Like in the uh, underground uh, platform will be far more dangerous because people can engage with more radical um, speech. And you know, chilling effect may uh, happen because people feel that their speech will be deleted. Under the judicial procedure, under the legal procedure, exactly the same level of the harm will likely to occur. In like they say, Me Too movement can be cracked down on outside with us. That, there's no guarantee that Me Too, Me Too movement will be approved under the judicial democratic procedures. If you try to impose a legal standard or judicial standard, that's far more likely to be more strict, even stricter than the platform or private media corporation. That is exactly the same harm is far more likely to happen when you keep the status quo, when we rely on political system or democratic system or judicial procedure to prosecute individuals in a legal manner, that's far more likely to be preventable, is shrinking discourse far more likely. And secondly, overall, their benefit is enrichment of diverse discourse with which people are able to uh, vocalize their grievances and opinion. That enrichment of discourse is very speculative or benefit. We can't see concrete result as a result of having diverse discourse, as opposed to speculative and ambiguity of the benefit. Protection of the most vulnerable and voiceless individuals is direct benefit because all of these people can immediately be able to circumvent psychological offense or spiritual insult that they have to encounter in a platform. Therefore, in terms of tangibility or likelihood, the benefit we defend is far more important and has greater magnitude over the speculative benefit that may happen or may, uh, may not happen as a result of this policy. Therefore, we have, won, we have already won this debate. I'm going to encompass two clash points in this debate. One, the expected role of media corporations based upon a discourse and protection of the minority. Secondly, the administrative comparison between harm and benefit. Moving on to the first questions about the expected role of social media cooperation. Their, their, their consensus of this debate is that infrastructure cooperation have some level of responsibility for customers, but this principle is contingent upon the practical consequences in many cases. That's why I would like to explore this principle from the perspective of actual practical consequences. There are four levels of rebuttals to the other side of the house. Number one, the premise of the other side of the house is platform is accessible to everybody because everyone is able to join the discourse, platform uh, should not uh, censor information. That's opposite. As long as majoritarian offensive comments are prevailing, the weak people or minorities are systematically excluded from the discourse. For example, when the YouTube put the video of Prophet Muhammad, there were so many backlash from the Muslim community because that video specifically targeted Muslim girls there. When uh, sacrilegious caricature was featured in the newspaper in Denmark, severe backlash uh, from Muslim community as well as the secular community happened because that caricature specifically targeted and constituted fundamental insult for Muslim people there. When a Christian priest, Terry Jones, burned Quran in public, so many backlash happened within not only from Islamic community but also from Christian community as well. And these kinds of pictorial form of imageries or expression are far more offensive for vulnerable minority people 
to the extent that these weak individuals are not able to take part in discourse anymore, these people are too fear so that their free speeches are restricted by the free speech of the privileged, a limited number of privileged, privileged people. This debate takes place in the context of trade offs. They are defending the free speech for privileged uh, people, rich people, who have no security of uh, uh, ambiguity at all, uh, anxious at all, versus free speech of vulnerable people are severely restricted because of the prevalence of offensive content such as uh, sacrilegious arts or are radically provocative arts. Therefore, their premise, the platform being accessible to everybody, is uh, realistically unlikely and untrue. That's rather opposite. Do you have any point of information? Yes. Go. So, tax avoidance is legal just, just justified, but it's probably not something we should celebrate. The same way social network services are justified in your ethics policy, but it's not celebrated in hijacking judiciary agreements or democratic agreements. Why is it celebrate war? Okay, that's uh, relevant to our second level of analysis. As they said, there are many uh, cons controversial issues surrounding moral question, maybe abortion, maybe tax haven, right? So let's compare a democratic judicial governmental procedure versus private corporations acting in a flexible basis. It's very uh, dangerous that we re solely rely upon democratic mechanism because majoritarianism is likely to hijack the discourse or decision-making process by politicians are likely to be monopolized by majoritarian interests. Moreover, the politicians are vulnerable to lobbying or sponsorship or to donation by rich people or limited number of privileged people. Therefore, the judicial mechanism or democratic model is more likely to cater to majoritarian interests or the limited number of rich people or privileged people. As opposed to that, private corporations do not have that level of political ideological incentive to cater to a like, specific number of people. Because of the global competitions, companies have to differentiate their services in order to make in order to be stand out or conspicuous. Because of this global competition, there's a commercial incentive for corporations to differentiate their services in a certain way. Therefore, in terms of diversity, we can target diverse range of people by intervention as opposed so that only limited number of people are being protected under the legal system. Hence, this comparison based on plurality or diversity, the kinds of minority that we can protect has better, uh, more diversity on that. About, uh, five, four, uh, thirdly, about the arbitrary criterion. We really believe that's good that a company can update their agreement in a standardized based upon the socioeconomic circumstances. For the government model, it takes a long time for court to approve or even one specific investigation. So in terms of efficiency, updating flexible updating model under the corporation is much better. Moving on to the final uh, issue about the comparison. Their argumentation is basically enrichment of the discourse and so many people are able to freely express their opinion. What's the concrete benefit as a result of that? That's very intangible benefit as opposed to the protection and security or safety for minority people in many circumstances has far more tangible impact in our society. Secondly, availability of discourse. Discourse that they protect is exclusionary because majoritarian people can scare minority so that they can no longer able, no longer take part in a discourse. But opposed to that, when this, the basic rudimental security is protected, anyone can join the discourse without any fear. We can see in some cases even the necessary discussions are marginalized, but that's fair trade-off, considering a huge benefit and protection and a tangible security for minority people. We are more than happy to sacrifice some level of great or meaningful discussion in order to uh, maximize a uh, total and uh, overall social utility. We are happy to propose. Thank you. First of all, this motion asks them to celebrate this action of SNS. They cannot win this debate by saying it's legitimate or it's legal. We admit it's legal or it's legitimate. It's a corporate right to do so. But we are saying we don't have to celebrate those actions by corporate by those corporations because they have duty, they have obligation. Even though it's legal, they cannot win this debate by saying that. 
And also, they have to also like, support controversial, like, the intervention into controversial posts. It's not about offensive posts at all, right? We are talking about controversial posts. For example, abortion is also controversial. Gay rights is sometimes controversial in the past. So they, those kind of old posts have to be supported, intervention has to be supported in the other side of the house. That's the bottom to do in this debate of government debate. Um, with that being said, I'll talk about two things in my speech. First of all, I want to summarize this debate from the perspective of user experiences and social discourses, which mainly coming from their side. And secondly, I want to talk about from the perspective of duty or obligation of role of social media cooperation, why we, have, we shouldn't celebrate those actions of cooperation. So firstly, from the perspective of users and society. From Prime Minister, they have talked to us, social media cooperation have to protect the most vulnerable in society. And it sounds good, it sounds very important. But we told you from already, you can block those kind of posts, we can, do, we can mute those kind of posts, we can reactively react, react to those kind of things. Yes, the other is, sometimes we have to be exposed to very offensive remarks unexpectedly, because we don't preemptively intervene those kind of things. But those kind of harm can be limited to many extent in outside of the house. And also, Mr. Speaker, please confirm their policy is also reactive, Mr. Speaker. Because social media cannot preemptively stop posting as you know, so, 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 right? so even in the other house, they have to reactively intervene into the post because we cannot really expect that kind of post we, we, is going to be com coming from those kind of users or so forth. That's why, Mr. Speaker, their harm is at, at best mitigatable and not mutually exclusive to begin with. Their example was this Muslim children of Denmark example is very problematic. Please be arrested. How did that these offensive posts actually harm the individual from the Muslim community? It's not the case. Muslim children, Muslim users, see those kind of posts in their own timeline because they don't follow those kind of users, they don't follow those kind of images at all. What happened in the past is actually liberals or those kind of critics, and the crit and the crit and people who write criticism find those kind of images from the other timeline or other, other groups and they show how the Muslim like, races are doing in the, that, kind of, that kind of timeline. That's why it's not the case that most vulnerable individuals are exposed to those kind of offensive images because they don't follow those kind of users to begin with. That's why you like their harm can be mitigated to begin with. And also, we told you from big period of abortion and never engaged by the government with those kind of images or those kind of offensive users is anyway ex is existing in their side of the house. Maybe they're going to underground. Maybe they, they, they cannot be challenged by anyone in those kind of circumstances. They suddenly emerge on the street and in the form of more offensive demonstration or violence in the worst case. But we cannot prevent those kind of radicals from walking on the street. That's why those kind of images will anyway emerge in their side of the house that cannot be more, they cannot be challenged in their case. Mr. Speaker. And, and also they talked about this talk because they are saying discussion in social media has tendency to heat up and be Sorry. emotional. This is a problem. <coughs> yes, it's true to some extent, but it's very like I parallel that there, there's also rational discourse in the outside house. There may be heat up, heating up discourse, but also many people who like rational discourse, who like logical discourse existing outside of the house. That's why maybe heating up discourse is existing, but, but it's not a reason to delete those kind of old, old kind of those posts in the outside of the house. That's why it's not problematic. Yes. If people can block each other, no one can challenge anybody. What's the benefit of having this kind of debate in the first place? As we told you, people who feel very uncomfortable with those posts are blocking those kind of images and actually they don't follow those kind of users. But liberals, for example, people who like criticism towards those kind of races are looking for those kind of images and what kind of thing is existing in the world in other, other people's timeline, that kind of thing can be found in the outside of the house, but uniquely different in the outside. And they got to challenge it, our exclusivity by saying judicial procedure are also making change effect, all those kind of same thing will happen in the outside of the house. But as a confirmation, their policy is this, SNS self-censor plus judicial procedure, because that's the status quo, our policy judicial procedure only. That's why at least it's very different, because SNS is actively intervening the post in their side of the house, but, but it's not true. And they already admitted judicial procedure is very difficult and very slow to change. That's why we have very limited amount of regulations. We only intervene to hate speech, which is objectively defined in the outside of the house. That is crucially different. That's why, Mr. Speaker, comparatively, maybe some kind of most offensive remarks are deleted in the outside of the house, but we allow controversial images, controversial posts in the outside of the house. That's the benefit we told you from the area of opposition. So ultimately, perhaps in the outside, there might be victim of offensive remarks before they mute those kind of contents out and follow those followers. But we told you how that can be mitigatable to most extent, and we also told you how the other controversial, like, controversial posts can be like, deleted in the, in the outside of the house, and those people feel, uh, feel chill to do those kind of offensive remarks that feel damage user experience in the outside of the house.
So secondly, from the perspective of corporations, first of all, as I told you, they cannot win this debate by saying it's legal. It's legal, of course, they have corporate rights to do so, but we don't support the celebration of those rights, those uh, actions, because we told, th their argument was this, that they have a right to do so because they are private, en they are private entity. But Given the unique feature of social media, we are saying they have an obligation to allow that as much information as possible to come into the discourse and come into the platform of SNS. For example, right, in, like, even, though the, even though in general a private corporation have a right to do so, for example, electricity companies cannot choose for, like, users, so water companies cannot choose customers in their side of the house. Meaning, if a corporations are very influencing that infrastructure of society. They have to be regulated to many extent and even in the outside of the house. Maybe it was not true decades ago, but in the status quo in 2018, it's very, the SNS is very key a function to make people recognize new emerging rights, for example. But it's very key function as a political discourse in, in, in current situation. That's why we think as a social network services, which is as, as like, social infrastructure, we don't think we have to like, um, celebrate those things. And also they, they lack the mechanism as to how social media corporations can make more profit by doing so. And actually, it's not the case empirically. For example, Twitter was recently very criticized by deleting some users who are criticizing government of who are too liberal, for example. That's why even though we take their base case, corporations have a right to make their own profit, we are not sure how Twitter or Facebook can make more profit in their side of the house. And that are criticized in their circumstances, we think it's problematic. So above all, we told you how user, like, users have like offensive and like, victim of offensive mass can be mitigatable to much extent compared compared using exclusive harm to, to be sure to make expression and make this cause is going to be deprived in their side for that reason very proud of us. basic arguments of government. We need to protect minorities 100%, we should do everything to it. Question is, is it justified? Second, is this bit of an idea, just a bit of an idea, unsubstantiated about repeated discourse that sort of discord, distorts it. So, first on minorities, second on discourse. So, government side, once again, just wants to protect minorities. That's probably good that we restrict everything for the sake of protection. That's their rhetoric. Um, as we agree that it might be quick, quick, but we already told you that most of it, maybe 90%, I don't know, but we can block or just avoid those content and experience that. Defamation laws or hate speech laws are able to reasonably protect these people on the ground. So the question is, what about minorities who are harmed but defamation laws or litigations or blocking would not do? What about things that are imbalanced with freedom of repression? We told you the realistic scenarios where it's controversial. The scenarios where some people feel it's so offensive anyway if some privileged person said something, they feel that because of the past experience they might feel offensive. Or because it's, there's just 280 words, if you condemn and sort of going too far black rights movement or Me Too movement, that might seem sexist or discriminatory to you. That is probably protecting minorities feelings, but still imbalanced with people's legitimate expression for their own opinions and simply representing their own right. Or for example, you claiming for the right to abortion might be offensive and harmful to pro-life people and vice versa. You saying that a life is important might be offensive to women suffering on the ground for the need of abortion yeah, yeah. and the legitimate opinions. And that's why it's so important that it's always a balance must be assessed. And because it's so important, we voted for it. We agreed on it. And that's why judiciary is the most experienced people assess, assess it. And the question was, why is it that the SNS are able to hijack it? At least the question was, why is it also no social network services like random offices? They might be good at IT, but why are they the legal professionals, the moral professionals? They provided us no mechanism why they were better at least, or no challenge in why they were able to not say that judiciary was okay. To the extent that it was a comparative in this debate, if they not, do not substantiate that comparative it, they obviously lose. And that's why we know minorities might be harmed. We know we cannot protect these unfortunate people, but recognizing that we did agree that it's in balance with the right of people to express their own views, that we agreed that balance should be that we respect those opinions, your right to say, and that was, that was, that was agreement, their value judgment that we should infringe on the right to say for the sake of minorities is not an agreed, agreed judgment, or it's an arbitrary intervention by random private actors, and that was intolerable. 
Then, they also said that, you know, um, where did I go? But they also did not respond to the fact that even if we can see that there might be a bit of a benefit, you know, there might be first contact and quit. We already told you that it was also unjustified. And also, we already pointed out that, you know, you just post it and delete it in a few hours, a few minutes ago, a few minutes later, so not going to be able to prevent it. So there's no material benefit on their side of the house, at least the benefit that they caused was illegitimate. But also, they were sloppy in engaging to arguments about backlash. So we told you when you ostracize these people from the, like, society, from the Facebook, they are rather anger because they don't understand the consistency of the policy. They rather have antipathy and why they go to rather physical attacks of like hate graffiti or going on in street violence or spitting on minorities next to you and things like that. It's more likely to happen. Their response is that it happens anyway, but we told you the logic of why it's more likely to happen so the vivid harms on the people on the ground is more clear. So we understand that there might be a bit of SNS Vacation, you can protect, protect it on the side of the house. They would rather have more tangibility of physical offenses or more direct attacks on the ground likely to happen on compatible or the practical consequences. So once again, they don't take this issue of minorities. Shortly on discourse. So, you know, we do, we do understand that it might be heated, but they told us why that heated was bad. Necessarily, who don't, who don't block but engage in that heated discussion like that sort of discourse. But it's rather told you that the non-existence of examination is rather not this radical going too far, being too violent like the Black Lives Movement. That was far more harmful, once again, no response. And why ultimately, it's just unjustified. The Native made a very clear stance that they said the judicial regulation is okay, but what they are against is private regulation by these private corporations. At that moment, we think that the Negative team has took a burden upon them to explain the difference in mechanism of how a judicial, under a judicial regulation, all the potential harm that they have been given will not occur, and all the benefit that we have been proposing will still exist. We don't think that they have explained a mechanism or a logic to differentiate a judicial regulation on a private regulation. So just asserting democracy or just asserting random private actor is not a logical explanation to differentiate judicial regulation and private regulation, and that is the failure of today's negative team. So two issues to summarize today's debate. One, the impact on social discourse. What we have been telling you is that the expression in social media is very likely to ra radicalize, one, because less, and as a consequence of that, one, less number of people participate in a discourse, but two, the discourse becomes more emotional rather than rational. The only response we heard from the negative is that the users will preemptively block contents that would potentially offend them. Like, like, then how are you going to guarantee the participation of discourse if people continuously block content uh, for, from con controversial issues? The failure of the negative team is that they haven't explained a logical reasoning of the what kind of content that the, this, this discourse is going to happen, what kind of mechanism, what kind of conclusion will this potentially controversial and offensive discourse facilitate? And the response coming from the opposition Whip, I think, was that like certain liberal minority people who can handle these potentially controversial issues won't block content, so we're still going to have like conversations and discourse. What kind of benefit, ladies and gentlemen, is like ha having a discourse if only a small number of like in intellectual liberal people are having this discourse? Because in their discourse, they're not going to have the most important people participating in that discourse, which is the victim of certain social issues, which we need to protect. So they haven't really explained the importance of the discourse that they're going to have in their policy. They moved on in this saying that like, the uh, uh, discourse on Black Lives Matter or the discourse on Me Too could be censored as a controversial content. Now we gave you two responses to this. Like one, you don't need to post like kill all white cops to facilitate a meaningful discourse on police brutality. The negative team didn't explain why like it's necessary for offensive content to facilitate what kind of productive discourse. We're more than happy to allow like the discourse on like the Black Lives Matter movement on a rational basis. But second of all, we think we, we as I mentioned. In my, like, my own speech, like corporations aren't stupid, and these standards of regulation and the criteria of regulation constantly update based on the demand of the user. So if the user and the corporation recognize that there are certain values in that controversial content, they're going to compl com constantly update the regulation. They haven't given any response to that. Moving on to the second issue, the protection of the vulnerable. So what we have given you from the affirmative is that the, these kind of offensive content on social uh, media is particularly dangerous and needs 
protection, uh, we need to protect the vulnerable uh, from these content. One, because it oftentimes the dehumanization factor makes uh, uh, makes like normal people express very vile things in social media. But second of all, like defense and bully occurs on an individual level, wider than a mass level. And the only response we constantly heard from the negative was that like user would preemptively block this. I've only explained to you in my speech that that is not enough because you cannot preemptively select and block every single user content that could potentially offend you and undermine your identity. And then the only response coming from the web was this policy is also preemptive and reactive. So there's no difference between the status quo. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that like fortunately for us, the deputy of opposition clearly explained the mechanism of how these kind of policies work, like profiling technology, a AI technology will kind of prevent these kind of like content from being like reached to uh, the, the kind of a vulnerable victim. So relatively, of course, obviously we won't be able to protect every single victim, but relatively compared to their paradigm, we think that the vast majority of victims will be protected under a paradigm, and that is why the affirmative theme wins. <laughs>